Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance, where you can sign up for the Shannon's Club and Penrite Oil, offering technical assistance seven days a week. And welcome to another exciting episode of Classic Restos. Not possible without Shannon's Insurance, where you can sign up and become a member of the Shannon's Club. Visit them online at shannons.com.au or pick up the phone and give Shannon's a call for a quote on 134646. Then, of course, there's Penrite Oil, the finest in oils and coolants, where they can also offer you a 24-7 technical assistance line. Check them out at penriteoil.com.au. And on today's show, I've travelled to Korowa in regional New South Wales to bring you the return of a very special event. This is the 35th annual GPA Swim-In, hosting a stack of military vehicles that have been either restored, replicated or simply preserved. Korowa is the chosen town every year for this event. Located on the mighty Murray River, it's home to almost 6,000 people, and with this military event in town, the population suddenly rises. Korowa is laced with wineries that attributes to a vast majority of the area's economy. You can spend days driving around trying different wines, backdropped by Australiana at its very best. Korowa also depends on agriculture and tourism, the backbone of survival like most Australian towns. An event such as this also represents legacy and respect for those who have served and returned and for those who have not. The Korowa RSL have been of great assistance here getting this event together and so too the Korowa Shire. So it's time now for this military event, the anniversary of World War I marking 100 years. It also marks the year of the Model T Ford. And there's no grander way to start today's episode than with this, a 1917 Model T Ford. Welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you, Fletch. Thank you very much. Ken, you've brought an amazing vehicle here. This is an incredible transitional period. I mean, we still had horses being used every day of the week when this car was built. Exactly, Fletch. That's correct. Ken, they played a major part in World War One. Just give us a quick rundown on this particular vehicle and the areas that this vehicle was used in that first war. Uh, they were used in, um, in North Africa, to the best of my knowledge, as Australian Light Car Patrol vehicles. Um, and I think they were sort of scout vehicles for the light horse, from what I can understand. What's amazing too is the conditions that these cars, well these vehicles, used to be under back in World War One. I. I mean, they were sent out on a mission. They obviously stood up to the task and did the job. Yeah, well some of the early pictures that I've seen of the early ones, they had no bodywork left on them at all. They were just sort of a platform with all the men's gear stacked on it. We've got a restored Model T Ford here, which is absolutely a credit to this gentleman. There's no doubt about it. What was it like when you got it, Ken? Uh, Fletch, it, it was, it's been pulled to pieces for over 40 odd years and uh, it was in bad shape. All the guards were cracked and it's still, it's still got a lot of dents in it, but um, it's been in the family for over 80 years, Fletch. 80, over 80, 80 years? Yes, yes, yes. So, okay, who did it belong to? It belonged to my father. He bought it in about 33 and uh, my sister was uh, only a baby in arms when they uh, moved all their belongings in the back of it from one location to another. How nice is that? How, how nice is that? You must feel so proud with this vehicle, Ken. Um, not only have you acquired the vehicle, restored it over many years, but just to have that history in the family to go back so far. It's, it's the history that really counts to me and then I decided that I would do it in, in Australian Light Car Patrol for this event. Yeah. Ken, I'd like to thank you on behalf for uh, turning up this year and bringing one of probably the most significant vehicles to the Coral Swim for 2014. Good on you, mate. Very much, Fred. Great to be here. With me now, we have a very proud Mayor, Fred Longmire. Welcome to today's show, Fred. G'day, Fletch. Good. How are you, mate? Oh, never better. This would have to mean so much to you, being the Mayor of Corowa, seeing the Corowa Swim turning up here each year. It's been running for decades. This year it's just getting bigger and bigger, isn't it? Uh, look, we welcome these people, absolutely. Uh, the attention to detail in all the equipment that they bring, plus uh, 
the money they bring and, and spend in our local community. We really appreciate uh, their effort to come from all over Australia. It's 35 years this year since they started coming. Fred, it's such a beautiful place too, right on the bend of the one part of the Murray River. There's a lot of wineries, uh, agriculture here is strong. It's a lovely area. I bet it's not a bad place to wake up every morning and go to work. Well, look at today's weather. Uh, this is typical and it's uh, interesting that every year they, came, they come, uh, this is the same type of weather that we get. And so, uh, no, we look forward to them. Um, they've been very... Uh, great in, in all they do around the community. They, uh, they do displays, they do street parades and uh, they have swap shops and so we welcome them absolutely. Mayor of Corowa, Fred Longmire, thank you for leaving the office and playing a part of this, coming down here to this event for this year. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Fred. Bike lovers, I have you covered on this week's episode of Classic Restos with this gorgeous 1939 BSA. Welcome to the show, Alf. Thanks, Fritz. My pleasure. So, Alf, you're here at the Corowa Swim for 2014. How do you feel riding this bike? Young again. Yeah. <laughs> Very much. Well, that's, that's good. Uh, what's the history of the bike? Well, I picked it up in 1956. It was used as a trail bike. And a young bloke stripped everything off it and all the rest and threw it away. And I restored it from then onwards. Well, so it obviously means a lot to you. Yes, it does. It's a bit of history anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're in theme back in the day. It's uh, a World War II bike. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about that? As I chased up the numbers and it had seen service in New Guinea and been brought back with the service and everything. And after the war was over, the PMG took it over and many other bikes. Yeah. And uh, when we got our discharge, we got jobs delivering telegrams and mm. stuff to Ballarat and... Geelong and places like that, because yep. we didn't we didn't have computers and that like you got now. Absolutely. They were those uh, uh, Morse code things yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. Then we stepped into telex machines and we thought we were a yeah. step ahead then, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah, we did too. Isn't it nice to see the accolades given, not just to cars, trucks, but the old humble cycle? I mean, you know, bikes. Bikes played a big part, didn't they? Yeah, all bikes, whether they were pushies or motorbikes yeah. or... Yeah. or everything. Absolutely. Okay, tell us about the engine specs, Alf. How, um, how does the old girl go? So, oh, it goes good. 500cc motor, and she cruises about 65 nicely, yeah. miles per hour. 500 single, that's a big piston. It sounds good. Yeah, it is. It, it gets a good thumpy noise. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big thump right underneath you, isn't it, Alf? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alf, well, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, you're the bike on today's episode, and I really do appreciate that, mate. Well done to you. I'm glad that you're here with us and thanks very much, Flit. I hope you're really enjoying the 2014 Corowa Swim and you're seeing it first on Classic Restos with a big thanks to Shannon's Insurance and Penright Oil. Back with more after this. The great wars around the world, the transport behind the scenes. These vehicles are seen here today. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, Fletch. Mate, 1941 Ford, a staff car. Amazing condition. You've restored it top to bottom. It looks brilliant. Thank you very much. It's, it's great. You've just done so well. How long have you had it? Oh, well, the, the restoration took 12 years. I started in 95 after the BJ50 run to Townsville. Bob, I looked at this vehicle for quite a while before we did the interview. It's really taken me in. When I first saw the body style, it reminds me of the woody shape. It is a woody. It is a woody. They... Uh, they started, the Woody actually started out as a set more as a commercial vehicle, known as, as depot hacks, more parcel delivery and stuff like that. But by the late 30s, Henry Ford had a massive hardwood plantation which he had to utilise somehow or other, so they pumped the Woody up as the top of the line vehicle. Mm. Ford sold more Woodies than all the rest of the major manufacturers combined, <laughs> and uh, that was it. Lurking under the hood, the famous Ford side valve V8. So many sizes, what's this one? 239 inch. Flathead, Mercury. Yeah. All rebuilt, no doubt? Yes, no way. Yeah. So, Bob, how does it drive? Oh, there's adequate power. There's adequate power. She, she handles it all right. Is it uh, 60, 70 miles an hour? You do 60 miles an hour, no worries at all, yeah, if you're yeah. game. See, not <laughs> if you're game. 1941 we're talking about. Something that can sit on 50, 60 miles an hour is doing a good job. I still can't help but think of the conditions. And I know I've mentioned earlier today's show, the conditions that these vehicles were working under. Again, uh, what part of the world? North Africa, though, mate. North yeah. Africa, the Middle East, Syria. Moving through into the interior, uh, being a staff car, this is interesting. Big table there for the for the for the uh, person at high level to sit in the back, put the maps on. Well, I don't know, do some colouring in if he's bored. I don't know. Yeah, well, there's even a, a light uh, built into the back of the 
front seat to illuminate the uh, the map table. They some of them had blackout curtains on the sides and or, and or a uh, full annex yeah. on the side. Yeah. So Bob, would these cars have been uh, targets for the enemy in terms of there could have been someone at higher level on board? Oh, quite possibly, quite yeah. possibly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just it's amazing. Even when you stop and think of who may have ridden in this particular vehicle. Working our way through to the back. Now, when you got the vehicle, there were telltale signs of a lot of wear from uh, drums moving around. Tell us that. Well, there's a false floor level with the sill of the rear windows, and underneath that is bolted the, it's part of the toolkit. And on the floor were one, gall uh, one gallon oil tin and two two gallon petrol tins plus toolboxes. It had done that much, that many miles in service that these items had worn marks into the floor and it would have taken a lot of miles to do that. Yeah, that, that doesn't happen in 20 or 30,000, does it? Well, the thing, well, in, under those conditions it yeah. could have, but I mean, yeah. the thing is that the floor was unfortunately so stretched yeah. that I had to replace it, but it was a shame. Okay, let's talk about the suspension, uh, the year of uh, moving on from transverse springs. Yeah, well, two longitudinal rear springs, a three-quarter ton truck rear axle, which is four inches wider track than the front, open tail shaft, uh, Still got the Hoodale lever arm shockies. Bob, look, thanks for bringing this vehicle along. Attention to detail. I know that's one of my favourite lines because what else do you say? You look at the wiring up around the roof turret, clipped into position. Uh, everything's done nicely. Uh, basically a car that was built no frills to do a mission in war and to see it so many years down the track in such good order from your attention to it, that's wonderful, mate. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much. With me now, event organiser Jan Thompson. How are you, Jan? Very well, thank you, Fletch. That's the way you've done it again? Yes, definitely. Great turn up this year. This event is getting bigger and bigger every year, and why wouldn't it be? There are more military vehicles getting dragged out of sheds, being preserved, restored, whatever the case may be, and of course being here in the picturesque Korowa. Yes. Yes, it's great to have this spot. It's a perfect location for what we do. How many years have you been running now? 35. So Jan, 2014, the military swim here at Cora. What's happening this year? We have Year of the World War One and Year of the Ford. That is our theme, the two themes for the year. And next year we have Year of the Emergency Vehicle and Year of General Motors. Wow. How cool is that? So every year, different theme? Yes. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah. It would too. I mean, there's so much history, there's so much legacy. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, these vehicles represent the backbone of transport uh, through the, the, the great wars around the world. They actually represent an era of terrible times. Uh, it's the remnants, I guess, of what's left um, in the transport industry relating to that time. Yes. And we also encourage people to bring any sort of military vehicle. They may not necessarily have a themed vehicle, so they can bring anything they want. It is such an interesting event. I mean, they, they call it the Korowa Swim for a reason, don't they? Yes. So we can put our amphibious vehicles in the water. Absolutely. Jan, thank you so much for your time and catching up here. You do a sensational event. The committee do a wonderful job as well. Before you go, drop the website for those that want to come along in 2015. Corowa swim-in.org. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming again, Fletch. That's right. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Moving through, as we do, 1916 World War I vehicle. Welcome to the show, Rick. Thanks very much, Fletch. There's no speeding fines going to be issued by the police here this weekend in Coral. We're not with vehicles like this getting around. Well, actually, they could be. If I do more than 32 kilometres an hour, I'm gone. <laughs> this is extraordinary. Actually, this is the sort of vehicle that does tuck at the heartstrings. There's a lot of emotion here. First World War. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, military vehicles here for this event. But there's not that many from World War One. No, that's right. There are a couple of replicas here, but this one was actually built in, in uh, 1916 and served in France and Belgium from 1916 to 1919. Standing next to a vehicle that you know has uh, seen action and been involved in the wars, it's, it's quite, a, I guess, a, an, an eerie sort of uh, feeling, isn't it? It certainly is. I've had this since 1972 and it just still gets me every time. Let's have a look at this. We've got uh, solid tyres, we've got chain drive. This is, uh, this is from the Ark. I mean, we're talking, you know, a prehistoric vehicle here um, in, the, in the term of things. When we look at what it went through, the way it was built, the mission it achieved, again, we come back to this uh, originality of what these vehicles looked like back in their day. And speaking of which, where did you find it? Uh, it was behind a sawmill in Lee and Gather in South Gippsland, Victoria. It was, uh, uh, had been used by a company for logging. They mounted a big winch on the back and used a chain drive to drive the winch. 
and then eventually uh, it was uh, dumped behind the mill, it was pushed into a pit, it was half buried and it was burnt. So there's no respect, is there? We're talking of a vehicle that went to war, in a sense to help defend the country. It came back and then was worked to death further, and then after that it was just forgotten about. A bloke like you, you've come along and you've saved its life. Oh, abs absolutely. There was more than 5,000 hours went into the initial restoration, and, and being an old vehicle, it's constant ongoing restoration work to keep it on the road. Engine up front, tell us some of the specs there. Uh, it's called 32.4 horsepower. Don't ask me the bore and stroke, I can't remember. But it's a side valve engine. Uh, the original engine had a fixed head, non-detachable cylinder head. This, this truck went back through the factory in 1921 and was updated with the new cylinder block. But it still runs the 1916 crankcase and crankshaft and conrods. Unbelievable. Tell us about the clutch system. Uh, the clutch uh, is unusual. Today's clutches, they have the, uh, the linings on the driven plate and they press up against the pressure plate and the flywheel. This one has the linings on the pressure plate and the flywheel, so it just has a driven disc. Well, this one, on this one it was totally rotted out, so we built it out of a, a, a saw blade. Went to a sawmill, picked up a saw blade, and we modified the saw blade to become a clutch plate. So you can, you can cut timber while you're sitting at the traffic lights? Uh, well, it sounds like that. It's better than cutting trees. <laughs> Back in World War I, what was its main purpose? What would it have been used for? Uh, generally, it's called a general service truck. It was to carry three tonnes of goods. Now, it could carry ammunition, it could carry stores, it could carry troops. What people don't realise, that in the First World War, the start of the First World War was all horses. There was no mechanical vehicles at all. A team of horses, four horses, two fellas and one vehicle, one horse-drawn vehicle, could carry one tonne, ten miles in one day on good roads. Yeah. All of a sudden, we had a vehicle that could carry three tonnes, ten miles in one hour. Wow. So yeah. put that into context, yeah. it shows the advancement of mechanical ability yeah. against horse. That was almost like an advancement overnight, to the point where people didn't believe in the machines back then. They didn't believe that they actually were so good, almost to the point where they were short-term and possibly a gimmick. Absolutely. In fact, a little bit earlier, the speed limit was four miles an hour. Mm. When this was built, the speed limit for this size truck, right up until the 1920s, was 12 miles an hour. So that's all it was built to do, 12 miles an hour. It will go a bit faster. It'll do 17 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Rick, thank you so much, mate. Uh, wow, what do you say about a vehicle like this on today's episode of Classic Restos? Thank you so much, Rick. My pleasure. Thanks, Fletch. No worries. Good. Classic Restos is usually about machinery that's been preserved or restored. But look what I have for you now. Big searchlight. This baby is brighter than the Belisha beacons. It'll burn your grass at 50 feet, save you mowing it. It's 90 centimetres wide, just under one metre for the digitally educated. The whole assembly is called a projector, but there's no Clark Gable coming out of this one. It has an exhaust fan mounted on top of the unit, enough power to not only suck the smoke from your kitchen, but the fish and chips out as well. It produces 200 million candle power of light. Sounds great, but imagine lighting that many then blowing them out. Range is 3,500 yards for the concentrated beam. Imagine if it wasn't concentrating. So, if I haven't lighted up your life after that, I never will. Moving through today's show, the 2014 Corowa Swim here in the gorgeous Corowa, New South Wales. How are you, Merv? Good, good, thanks, Fletch. Yep, great. That, that's the one. You've got a sensational Willys Jeep here, the year model? Yeah, 1942. Wow. Uh, that, when we got it, it was, a, it was a wreck. Merv, what you've done here with this 1942 Jeep is amazing. Back to the original code, as it was in action back in North Africa, I believe. Yeah, 1942 they were used, early into 42, and this one's done up as SAS. Uh, they used to go behind the German lines and cause havoc. Merv, the uh, engine under the hood, just a quick run down there. It's a side valve four-cylinder, um, back to what it was originally. Yeah, so it's... It's a Willys side valve, yeah. so this is a Willys Jeep, so, yeah. Murph, thank you so much for your time and being on today's show. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of variance in today's episode where we're trying to get each interview totally different in respect of the vehicle, and you've, you've, you've certainly uh, stood out with this one. Okay, no, no, that's great. Thanks, Fletch. Thanks, Murph. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Well, before I go, yep. not only is the Jeep in theme, have a go at Merv. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, you, you have, I mean, th this is amazing. It's, it's like as though I've stepped back into the Second World War and I'm, I'm, I'm here. It is the right uniform. We went over to England to the War and Peace show and 
we were floating blind before we went yeah. and we went over there and what we'd done was perfect yeah. yeah so everything we've got on here is exactly the way it was in 42 in north africa yeah. so that was that was great you guys with the camouflage underpants as well right oh, yeah 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 yep yep, yep. i'll <laughs> yeah, yeah i won't go any further with that one <laughs> Time for Dave now on today's show. How are you, Dave? Uh, good, thanks, Fletch. That's right, mate. What's the go here? Looks like a 13-foot-long cast-iron bath. Uh, yeah, that's pretty close, although it is mostly 16-gauge steel. Looking for soap holders on the thing, you know? Well, I guess you could use this uh, one on the side here to put some soap on it. But uh, tell, us a, tell us a story, Dave. The, the year model, the purpose where these particular vehicles were used. Uh, well, this one's a 1942 uh, amphibious jeep built by Ford Motor Company. Uh, they were uh, an adaptation, of course, of the World War II jeep uh, that was built by Willys and Ford. Uh, Ford were tasked with uh, making the vehicle more usable. Uh, the Army wanted to get a bit more out of the jeep, and they thought if it was amphibious, that you know that would be a great thing. And uh, so this is what they came up with. How did you acquire it? Uh, well, I've always had an interest in these. I've had an army jeep for about 28 years, and when I first got it, I saw one of these, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I'll have to get one of those one day. And uh, it took a number of years, and uh, about 17 years ago, I bought this one uh, off somebody who'd spent about 10 years collecting all the bits to build it up. So, um, yeah, it was uh, probably one of the best things I ever bought. It's certainly the most fun. What power is it, Dave? Uh, it's powered by the standard Willys Jeep engine, which is basically a 134 cubic inch uh, side valve, uh, four cylinder, and uh, develops a whopping 55 brake horsepower. Good on you, Dave. Thanks, mate. Okay, thanks, Fletch. Another neat feature of this vehicle, Fletch, is the seat cushions double up as life preservers. If you're going down, just pull them off, put your arms through here, lie back, and hope to be rescued. Graham, tell us, what is it? This is an Elvis Stolwart. Uh, Bodywork done by Elvis and the engine... Oh, just, sorry, it sounds funny, bodywork done by Elvis. But anyway, we've, has it got a guitar on the side of it or something, you know, some music theme? Well, it's got the Rolls-Royce. <laughs> it has the uh, eight-cylinder Rolls-Royce petrol engine. It does sound good. It definitely does, yes. Yeah. I had to have some redeeming feature when I took it home without telling my wife that I'd bought it and parked it on the nature strip. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the whole street would hear you arrive. Uh, well, actually, they all arrived at my place to see what I had uh, turned up with this time. OK, now, uh, a British product here. Now, give us a rundown on the history where these were used. Um, these were um, produced uh, between 1963 to 1973. The last one rolled off the production line um, was somewhere around $270,000 um, in 1973. And um, they spared nothing. They gave it six-wheel um, six drive, um, power steering, this one is actually amphibious. Um, you can take it out into the ocean and they could pick up um, log, um, supplies, fuel from the ships and travel back in, drive up the beaches and then inland over some of the most inhospitable um, terrain. If bridges get blown out, they just go straight down and then jet across the water. They have twin jets and then climb up the other side and then continue um, on. Graham, how does the uh, suspension work? Uh, the suspension is six-wheel drive independent suspension on torsion bars with four hydraulic shockers on each wheel. It rides fantastic. I can charge through this terrain and it will just ride um, like a sedan. They wonder why they call it the Corowa Swim. We've got the fantastic Murray River there separating Victoria with New South Wales. These guys turn up with these amazing amphibious vehicles. I mean, you just make this event so interesting. Graham, thanks for coming along, mate. Yep, my pleasure, Fletch. Thanks for having me on your show. No See you next year. Thanks, mate. Well, I hope you've really enjoyed this week's episode of Classic Resto is the 2014 Corowa Swim-In. And, of course, it's a big thanks to the Corowa Shire, Corowa RSL and Jan Thompson and the KVE team. Don't forget, classicrestos.com.au is the website that you need for the DVD boxed sets of the show, along with Classic Restos merchandise as well. You can find out information on travelling a Fletch tour to the United States of America, and of course how my major sponsors can help you as well. As I say at the end of every show, until next week, no matter where you're watching Classic Restos from, please ride and drive safe. I'm Fletch, and I thank you very much for watching. You can like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash classic restos TV and watch catch up episodes at shannons.com.au.
Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance, where you can sign up for the Shannon's Club and Penrite Oil, offering technical assistance seven days a week.